The webinar today will be approximately 45 minutes long, and we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. Um, we're joined today of a panel of experts. I'll introduce you to them in just a moment. My name is Carolina kirby Lucier. I'm the marketing manager here at OnRamp. I'll be the moderator. And after the webinar, I will be sure to email you a copy of all the slides and of the presentation so you have them for reference. So let's get started. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, compliance and security and where it stands today and how it is evolving into 2018. We'll also dive into how we got here. Um, you know, the third-party ecosystem includes suppliers, providers, vendors, uh, so we'll discuss that, and the data risks and challenges associated with each one. Um, and then we'll dive into those shared responsibilities. So who's responsible for what? And talk about best practices. And then again, we'll have questions and answers at the end of the presentation. You'll see in the panel on the left that you're able to enter your questions. Um, and then we'll just save them for the very end. Um, so with me today, I have Chad, which is the founder of OnRamp. So Hello. Welcome, Chad. Thank you for having me. So should I just introduce myself? Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I see. Um, again, my, I'm Chad Kai. I'm Chad Kissinger. I'm the founder of OnRamp. Uh, I helped found OnRamp uh, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, we started as an internet service provider and over the years really <coughs> evolved, evolved into a much different company. Uh, over the years we uh, were tasked or asked by our customers to not just help them with the internet but to really run their information systems uh, quite broadly uh, in their business. And today, uh, what we are is we, or we build ourselves as a managed services and data center services company that provides hybrid computing to our customers in three facilities. We have two data centers in Austin and Raleigh, North Carolina, where we provide what we call hybrid computing, which is a blend of co-location, uh, dedicated private clouds, and then cloud-delivered services that uh, uh, our customers use to uh, you know, affect computing uh, uh, in, in for, for their uh, enterprises. Now, whereas our customers do everything under the sun you can think of in, uh, in our data centers, we specialize in customers that have sensitive data, data that requires special care to protect its confidentiality, availability, and integrity. Uh, people like banks and hospitals and things like that, and that's in fact uh, a lot of what we're talking about today, about how to deal with uh, people that are dealing with healthcare data. And I'm very right. excited to be Thanks here, Carol. Again. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And also on the line, we have Maria Horton. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for coordinating this. I'm really happy to be here today because this is a, an exciting topic. I am the founder and CEO of MESEC Incorporated. We're a cloud security and engineering firm. But we have been working in the third-party space and compliance working with everything from FedRAMP in the federal sector to helping smaller private companies meet some of the new compliance requirements. I'm looking forward to your questions today and your thoughts related to the new ecosystem and the things that are changing out there. So feel free, think of your questions now and ask all of us. We appreciate you joining us, Maria. We're looking forward to your insights. And also on the line, we have Michael Casey. Hello. Thanks, Carolina. I appreciate uh, uh, you putting this together. This has been a good thing to look, to look forward to. Uh, just a little bit about us. Uh, I've been in uh, payments for about 15 years. i uh, been with two processors, one of the larger banks, and started EPMG about nine years ago. We're currently in the managing director. What we do is uh, we're an outsource manager of payment systems and services. We basically oversee compliance, data analytics, vendor management, and try to fill a critical gap for SMBs that lack uh, the specialized resources, you know, that the larger organizations have as it relates to things like PCS and other forms of payment. Michael, I think you're breaking up a little bit. Is there any way you could? Um Turn up your volume or check your connection. Yeah, I can try that. Just a second. Oh, that, that's a little bit better. Thanks. 
Well, we appreciate you being That's here, Michael, and look forward to your insights as well. Um, just to kind of kick us off, I just want to set the scene a little bit um, with a very telling statistic. That's from the Ponemon Institute. If you're not familiar with them, they do a lot of surveys and studies. Um, and you know, recently they discovered that about half of organizations are just not sure where, where their data lives, who has access to their data, um, how it's being used, and what, what strategies are in place to mitigate data risk. Um, so, you know, those are just the people that were surveyed, and that is just the people that were willing to admit that they're just not sure who has access to the data. Um, so you can imagine that the situation is, is pretty critical at this point, um, and that people are having trouble uh, keeping up with their data, managing it, and keeping it safe. And because breaches are, you know, reaching kind of the four million mark, and because uh, we're just seeing more high-profile cases, it really is becoming more important for people to invest in security um, across the board, not just within their own organization, but also as they bring in third parties to help them. Um, so with this in mind, what trends do you think what trends do you think have an impact, either directly or indirectly, in information security, you know, moving into 2018? Chad, we'll start with you. So, yeah, I, obviously uh, everybody's aware of these breaches and uh, the, the ever-increasing shocking nature of them with the Equifax <coughs> breach that we just saw with all of our personal information, <coughs> which really is, a, I think, a watershed event breach in that um, the data that was revealed could actually be used to affect other breaches in the future. If you've ever been questioned by your bank or try to identify yourself to a bank or somebody, they often ask you these questions that are contained in your, in your, um, in your credit report that was just lost. Uh, I just read about an article the other day about an, an S3 repository, which is a, a, a repository for data on Amazon Web Services that was found exposed and uh, some researchers went into it and found 100 gigabytes of data that represented the U.S. Army's entire intelligence database for Afghanistan, including the application of how to access it. Wow. So that was their active data. So we can see that the impact of these, these, uh, these events are, are increasing uh, and becoming uh, more, more controversial and more, more difficult for business people to uh, respond to. But if you start looking at them, uh, the real cause of them, I think, is, is the increasing complexity of of technology and the, and the increasing number of people that are involved in technology. So, for instance, uh, the example I just gave of, of the Army losing track of its, of its uh, intelligence data was, uh, you know, uh, most likely caused by just a breakdown in communications between different people. Somebody, uh, they probably had very good security around uh, an installation and information system and then somebody came in and changed something or disconnected something from that storage place and the right processes weren't in the place, maybe the right communications weren't in place, maybe we had a, maybe there was a contractor that didn't understand the requirements of that storage, uh, and something broke down and that, that it was left open. So that's the real challenge I think it kind of encapsulates, the real challenge that businesses and enterprises are, are facing right now is the increasing complexity of IT, the fact that we're starting to use, uh, outsource things to other people, the fact that we're starting to shift applications to the cloud, uh, the fact that we're starting to use cloud computing and to blend all those in a hybrid fashion uh, is really creating uh, a level of complexity that's very difficult for, for enterprises to address, and that's why we're seeing these mistakes. So uh, this is Maria. When I look at this slide, I think it's a great picture of many of the issues we're going to see from 2018 forward. 50% of the organizations don't know who has access to their data, but the reality is they are often giving away their data to cloud applications and third parties, and they're sharing that information oftentimes without asking about what safeguards are in place. Many of them are asked to sign service level agreements without any identification of how they would respond in a security event. So I often recommend to our clients who are in the federal marketplace or who are small private businesses, small and medium-sized, do you have a security SLA in which you're looking at 
someone reporting to you if there is a breach or how to respond. I also think it's um, important to think about 2018 and forward from a compliance perspective. Although security doesn't equal compliance and compliance certainly doesn't equal security, the reality is, is many businesses and federal agencies and state and local are being held to a higher standard from a privacy perspective with compliance as well as data security breaches. And so when we look at this, one of the key questions that you need to ask yourself is do I get more security by going to a cloud hosted environment or is it about the same as the individuals that manage my information technology department on premise or in house? Am I able to increase my ability to protect that information? Because the reality is, this in is some Gerald. instances, the compliance might actually cost you more money. In the last few years, no, the Federal no, no. Trade Commission has gone, um, has gone yes, forward and brought cases no, against fine. a number of individuals um, related to not honestly or openly recommending or protecting data and information. The conference has been and muted. Did you just mute that? Don't mute that. The conference has been muted. The conference has been unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Sorry, Maria. We were... Sorry about... It, for for those of you That's who are okay. online, if you don't mind being on listen-only mode, please continue. Sorry about that. No worries. The last point on this slide that I think is important to take away is the risk of non-compliance with regulations. One are the penalties that you might receive from organizations like the Federal Trade Commission or the they FCC have. if you have IoT capabilities. The other capability that I think is important to look at in the risk of non-compliance is that under controlled right. unclassified information and DFARS, there is the potential that you may not be able to work in the federal environment. And you'll hear more about that right. as we go forward. Thank you. Michael, do you have anything to add about trends that you might be seeing within your space? Yeah, I actually wanted to say that because of uh, the breaches and things that are happening, uh, just like Chad was stating, you, I think what we're going to see here in the coming year, um, when we look at things that happen, like with Equifax and Uber, PCI being more in the forefront than it has been in the last several years, I think you're going to have more companies looking and asking questions like, how do they handle PCI and, you know, should they use things such as third, part, third parties and uh, what, what's involved in that process? Um, I think they're going to ask questions like who do they reach out to for those things and companies that are going to, companies are going to be looking for these TPSVs to uh, or third party security providers to uh, meet some of the needs that they're going to have um, to be secure, to be secure and um, I think that that's what we're going to see here coming up, is more companies looking to, for those uh, third routers to meet that need. Okay. Um, Chad, can you kind of bring us up to speed about, uh, you know, why you would offload some of your needs? Sure. So uh, obviously, people uh, there's a variety of reasons uh, to use a third-party provider. Uh, you get greater expertise. Uh, it's a, it's a, a way, there's many different reasons. As I look past the past 20 years, 25 years of, of dealing with our customers, they really have moved across the spectrum um, from being uh, having all their computers in their own on the premise to the next move was to, into co-location where they basically stop worrying about generators and, and, and electrical things like that and air conditioners. And then they moved into managed hosting or we, we call them private clouds where they, uh, uh, they stopped worrying about uh, computers themselves and, and routers and networking and things like that. They just worried about operating systems and above. And now they're moving out into placing their applications in the cloud or, or replacing their applications with a cloud delivered service like replacing CRM with Salesforce or, or you know, having an exchange email with having uh, Gmail or something like that. So as they have, as it's obviously the, being able to move out in the cloud provides a great deal of a number of benefits. 
in that you, you get to uh, 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 offload many of your, uh, many of the requirements or the needs, that, or the expertise, needs for expertise that you would have if you, if you did that internally to your, to your business. But uh, the problem with that a lot of the times is that the, uh, uh, the uh, you know, as you move out into the, using the third party providers, uh, a lot of times they don't have the expertise necessary to do to deal with the. We switch slides again. Uh, we don't uh, have the expertise really to uh, to deal with uh, compliance and 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 things like that. So uh, it's important to find providers. Obviously, they understand that, especially if the customer is is somebody dealing with sensitive data, like a bank or a hospital or something like that. They might be able to find a, a computer and IT outsource provider <coughs> that is easy to deal with. Um, but uh, they don't, that IT service provider doesn't necessarily understand HIPAA or things like that. Uh, and there's a breakdown in that, which is, I think, the next slide, right, in here? Right, I thought that's what. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just transitioning <laughs> with all the beeping and everything, yeah. it's kind of confusing. The, uh, so the breakdown, what happens though is, is you have a problem with this, uh, with compliance regulations, um, in that uh, they, when, uh, HIPAA is a great example, the HIPAA security rule and the breach notification rule are great examples of regulations that were written uh, by regulators that, that pictured um, the, the person following the regulations as being one company. So I'm going to write a HIPAA regulations, I'm going to write it for a hospital, and I think the hospital is this one monolithic entity that's dealing with it. And as we just discussed, that's not what's happening today. What's happening is people are shifting their loads, their applications into kind of this hybrid uh, uh, place where they have some of their operations internal to their business and some, turn, some of their operations out of their business. And the regulations, for instance, the security rule, the breach notification rule under HIPAA, don't really contemplate having subcontractors, although they, they, they do in the sense that they have requirements uh, for business associate agreements and things like that. They don't really talk about how to do uh, things like encryption or make sure you do media sanitization properly between you have multiple parties involved in that. So the, the regulations themselves don't contemplate how that we coordinate third parties working together with with uh, their customers. Maria, do so you have there is to some, that? yeah, I do. So there are some differences related to this. We are seeing in all sorts of places where there are entire small and medium-sized businesses that outsource outsource everything from the back office to their public relations department, and it's very interesting to see how flexible and agile they are, but how they are also accomplishing compliance and security from third parties, either organizations like MESEC myself or like Michael's organizations and others are stepping up to the plate and offering solutions and services. I also think that when you look at this new world, and we're calling it the digital frontier or digital transformation in many locations, what you are seeing is that you need to apply some very um, baseline business practices. How did you identify who you were going to utilize? Did you look at your contract and identify the elements that you want to protect, not only from a service and business perspective, but also from a security and an information sharing perspective? And this has been somewhat awkward for some locations, and for others, they've moved in it, into it very easily and quickly. Compliance really requires you to be responsible. They don't really care necessarily how, the, how you accomplish that. And I think that's lent itself very nicely to applications and cloud capabilities within the infrastructure. We're also seeing that the supply chain actually needs to be looked at at multiple levels. Many folks think about the supply chain one-on-one. -on -one. My organization contracts or teams or partners with one other organization. The reality is when you're thinking about security and compliance, you not only have to think about the partner that you have, but who are their partners and who are their partners, sometimes four and five levels deep with suppliers and vendors. And so thinking about security can be very complex as we move more and more elements into a solution, services, cloud, and IoT environment. <laughs> yes. 
Are you are you finished, Maria? I'm sorry. Um, I am on the last slides. If there's um, another capability on where yeah. we are, like the data risks and top challenges, one of the things that's really interesting to me and I try to share with everyone is that when you're accomplishing um, compliance and you're looking at cybersecurity, you want to be clear about who's responsible for what. That includes starting a service. That includes ending a service. It also makes, means identifying in your policies and processes. So for instance, as we go forward with cloud capabilities in all sorts of hosted solutions, your policies need to address not only what you can see and touch from a physical perspective, but what you have and what you are using in the cloud or in a remote location. In some instances, you will need to develop policies related to third parties and how you interact and what your expectations are, separate from your contract. And it may refer to them and they may be addendum. One of the biggest things that we really see is that governance is one aspect, but due diligence is another. How you select a third party, how your board, if you're a large company, um, you have a board of advisors or a board of directors, is informed and receives reports because of the fiduciary responsibilities. As an owner, even in a small business, you can be sued if you haven't been prudent and you haven't practiced good fiduciary responsibility. We also see insufficient technology, and this is kind of an odd statement. People can go out and buy applications and technology. They can utilize freeware. There's a number of capabilities out there, but sometimes there are gaps in where the technology exists and those are not necessarily identified without strong risk assessments. And there are always, there's always, I tell my customers, there's more than one way to accomplish some of the compliance and the security capabilities that you need to, accomplish, you need to do. Look for those new ways because it will help to grow and move your business further into the next evolution of some of these third-party capabilities. Um, Michael, any comments? I wanted to, this is Chad, I wanted to add something really quickly. I, th I think that that's, uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, the, the, the third, the thing that we see a lot of times is, is this confusion on, on the customer's part. And we, uh, kind of from my role, an interesting part of my role is I interact with people in so, so many different roles at our customers' businesses. So oftentimes uh, I'll be talking to a technical person, we'll be in a, you know, we'll have a sales opportunity or something, and and uh, I'm called in because I know a lot about uh, compliant computing, and we're talking to a technical person, and we're talking about the nitty-gritty of how to do media sanitation or how to do encryption. And then later, uh, and they know that those technical people are very aware that encryption needs to occur, and they're very, they're, they want to know that, uh, uh, that it's, the, the specifics of how it's done, but they don't know really the legal requirements of, of the strength of the encryption or things like that. Then we'll talk to the attorneys. That, um, go ahead. No, I was going to uh, say that's a great point. It depends on where you sit, right? There's that age-old story about your perspective is based on where you sit. And I like that you brought up the technical comments because more and more of compliance and security is less about the technology and more about the governance and the next steps, the follow-up and capabilities. Right. So a good example of that is... A good example of that breakdown of where that happens is, is then you move, then I'll move on to later in the deal where I'm talking to a lawyer and we're negotiating. We've signed a contract with the customer, and now they've come back and because they're a HIPAA customer, because they're a covered entity or they're dealing with healthcare data, EPHI, they want to then negotiate a, a, as an afterthought almost a business associate agreement um, that talks about how we're going to collaboratively protect the confidentiality, availability, integrity of this data that we're that we're that we're both uh, interacting with. And those, those, the lawyers that we're dealing with and the technical people that are both work for the same, my customer, they, they have different views on, ha on what's supposed to happen, and I don't think they oftentimes are talking to each other about, about uh, what's supposed to happen. So I think uh, I see in our customers a lot of a, a, a big chasm in understanding between the CEOs, the people that are making the economic decisions, the technical people that are implementing the technology, 
And then the, the compliance or the governance people, the people that are doing the legal work or understanding what the regulations, and the, all three of those people don't really, typically don't have a very good uh, consistent view of what's, what should happen and what's supposed to happen. I, I think, think that's I a great segue. I actually wanted to jump in here real quick if I could, just to say that that's one of the things that we deal with a lot also, and that's one of the things we try to bring to the table is centralizing that where there's one point of contact that can pull all of those things together. One of the things I think Maria was saying with um, looking at the vendors and checking into the vendors, it could be three, four, five vendors deep and making sure that each of those uh, vendors are doing what they need to do to be in compliance because compliance is for so long as it, it has been something else that was brought up that it's been pushed so far into IT, and that's one of the things that everybody's looking at. But I think one of the things that Chad was saying, um, which we found out also, is we deal a lot with the general counsels um, and putting together the uh, agreements and policies and things like that and how they're going to work with the third-party providers and how they're going to monitor those relationships over the long term. Is something that companies that think really need to look at and pay attention to also. And, right. I, and my comment was going to be, if we can go to the next slide, I think both comments um, are very appropriate. When we look at guidance, we have to look at guidance from compliance and where penalties and liabilities may exist, but we also have to look at accountability with the hands-on. I am a big believer in standards, and so when we look at guidance, we don't want it to tell every business of every size how to do things the same way, but we want to have stability in the way we look forward. So NIST and all of its publications are critical. We've listed a number of them here, 800-145, 800 800-166, 852, <coughs> excuse me. There's also 800-171, 853. There's FISMA, there is FedRAMP for clouds in any of the federal marketplaces. What I encourage the customers to do is to look at it not only from the IT perspective, but the back office and legal perspective, the client compliance perspective, and to pull all of those together such that the organization is protected. And if you go back through some of these um, guidelines, you'll find that they deal with management, operations, and technical. Technical is oftentimes the easiest. Operations is that day-to-day -day phone call. Who's going to do the follow-up? And then the management piece is really where we get into the longevity of performance. I want to call out two particular um, publications on this slide. One is the fact that FedRAMP is the standard for federal cloud usage with DOD and the civilian sector. But FedRAMP is being used internationally with um, general data protection, GDPR, as well as um, we've seen in Canada, UK, and in France that FedRAMP, because it's available on the website, is being used as a baseline good housekeeping seal of approval with foreign cloud services. We're also seeing it at the state and local level because some of the states and local levels can purchase cloud services off of government federal contracts. So that's kind of interesting. The other rule or um, document guide that I'd like to bring to your attention is breach notification rule. Under HIPAA, under NIST, under US CERT, under FedRAMP, under GDPR, there are time limits on notifying others about a breach. You may want to be notified by your supply chain, those vendors and suppliers that you deal with, if they are breached. You need to understand how you are going to report and where you're going to go. The guidance always talks about reasonable and appropriate, but there are oftentimes specifics within those. Do you have an incident response plan? Can you respond within 72 hours? Who is actually responsible for answering those questions and filling out those forms? So the guidance is there. Use this slide as kind of a way to move forward, but always keep in mind that you can customize it for the best possible security and compliance within your own organization. I think that's, Maria, I'd like to add to that. Uh, you know, when we negotiate business associate agreements, uh, I have yet, whenever I get one from a customer, they're always well written, but 
you know, there's uh, uh, healthcare patients have the right to access, <coughs> amend, and get an accounting of access, the list of people who've seen their da healthcare data. And they, they, they carry that right to anybody that holds the data, including business associates like us. So our business associates agreements always talk about what happens if a patient comes in and asks for their data. And universally, almost uh, without exception, the business associates that we get proffered by our customers say that we're going to go expeditiously do that. We're going to grab the data from our customers. We're going to go find this medical record. We're going to go within a certain time frame, respond to them. And this is a perfect example of, how, of the disjointed nature of the, the, the environment today where we have people writing uh, requirements in a legal document separated from reality from a, in a technical world what would happen. As a, as a data center provider, there's no way I'm going to get on one of my customer's computers and go into their database and grab a particular record out. Of a, 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 it's just not in the, t in the type of work that we do for our customers. We don't get into their databases and extract uh, particular sets of data. So, uh, but universally, our customers, the, 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 the agreement that is offered to us tells us that we're going to do that. So this is a real important part that I talk to our customers, and I think a real benefit of dealing with a provider that is actively focused on dealing with sensitive data is that they're not going to just sign a boilerplate business associate agreement. When we sign our business associate agreements, we talk about, I, I push those back all the time saying, we can't do that. So we need to talk about what's, going, what's really going to happen if a patient calls us, which is we're going to notify so our that's customers. So hate, hate to interrupt, that's really interesting, sure. but that is really changing with GDPR. And there right. are requirements coming forward, and there are new tool sets that are out there that I have been introduced to, I've looked at from a white labeling perspective, because under NIST 853, which is in draft format, it came out in August of this year, at the government, at the United States government level, many of the federal agencies in DOD will actually have to go and search for information, and the right to be forgotten and the right to opt out is coming up in language over and over again. So when I work with customers who are new, small businesses, I work with them on the design level and say, you need to design this in. You need to understand what tools you're going to use to go back and extract that. Some folks are going to have to retrofit and use add-on tools to be able to search that data. Others are going to be designing from the very beginning for that kind of new privacy and compliance. In my opinion, 2018 going forward. Well, one of the things that companies also need to be paying attention to when completing things on the PCI data security standards, when they're completing their SAQs and things like that, is understanding, having a better understanding of the car data environment and determining, you know, when working with the third parties, determining the scope of who does what. You know, for example, in those things, many of the situations that we deal with, you want to see, you want to be able to check where, where, who's handling the physical security. A lot of people think that physical security is completely outsourced, but that's only one piece. They still have that process they need to take care of inside, and that's a shared process there. Um, the requirement 12 that they have for completing their ISPs, um, a lot of them are not prepared to do that either, and that's not something that they're going to get from the third-party organizations when they are just moving all of their um, – equipment and so on and so forth into a shared facility. But the misconceptions revolving around these things of what a third party can do um, and what they can't do, which we usually say people are trying to third party out of compliance, is thinking that they can move all the responsibility to them without doing anything else, where they have to go out and also, as we've discussed in several of the other things, where they're going to have to get that validation documentation from them um, from the third-party provider and make sure they have those written agreements and policies in place where they can manage, again, the relationships they have with them. Now, Michael, can you dive in a little bit deeper on the policies and processes for us? I'm sorry, right. I didn't hear that. Can you talk to us a little bit more about developing policies? I know that we've kind of discussed the fact that just creating policies isn't necessarily the right thing to do because you can you can create policies, but they might not be the right ones. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about um, establishing the right policies and processes depending on your particular business? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are, 
there's a couple areas organizations need to pay close attention to with, you know, high-level points, I'll say, for determining responsibility. One of the things that they need to do is uh, they can develop a responsibility matrix, and that's basically a schedule or an appendix that's going to detail responsibilities of the parties in an agreement. It's more of an easy-to-understand um, model. They can have put together a format. Uh, and the responsibility matrix, uh, the T the third party provider it it will be useful in helping to identify a variety of issues um that they could possibly come up with. Uh in technology it can help in the areas of who's purchasing system components, who's you know, the building of the systems components, uh the testing and deployment of those things and the different uh technologies they're going to use. Certain processes that they would come across would be Things like the operational procedures that they're going to need to put in place, notification requirements. And these are things that most companies don't think about when they're putting these things together. They, they think it's a very simplistic process, but the initial setup in which you're going to get, um, you really want to be looking at all these different areas. You know, what audit procedures are you going to go through, the data and evidence retention and destruction, um, because they have your data and they're, they're – they have it on their facility. So you want to make sure that you can uh, have all of this listed out and be able to, you know, go back to that and use it in your, you know, forward uh, movement with those companies. So I'd like to add something here. One of the interesting things that we're seeing are a lot of requests for policies and procedures and security plans at the federal level where one company is going, in order for me to trust you, I need to see more information about your system or your capabilities. We usually encourage folks to allow people to see but not retain a copy or not hold copies of certain plans if they wish to. We've seen charges being requested. If you want a copy of my plan, you're going to need to pay for it and you need to sign a liability type waiver because there are concerns that access to security data, security policies and procedures actually puts your organization at greater risk. So I think we're going to see some evolution in how we handle policies and processes. Yes, you must have them. Yes, you'll probably need to attest to them. But the amount of sharing and how that sharing occurs can be done in a positive way, but it also can open you up to insider threats and potential risks. And, and that's just something to keep in the back of your mind because you always want to protect your system from any other potential risks that may be out there. Right. I don't know anything. I don't, don't know a lot of the things that are going on as far as uh, the charging, but definitely you want to get out there and be able to get things like the report on compliance and uh, the attestation of compliance from those uh, third parties that you're looking to work with, making sure that Absolutely. they're doing their due diligence and finding out what was involved in that uh, report on compliance so that that helps determine the scope of who's responsible for what and what they're actually going to be able to handle um, that you're not going to be responsible for in that scenario. The other, the other key part that Michael brought up is about policies and procedures. I'm always pointing to the incident response plan. If you are three or four layers deep and there's a breach, it, or you're using, say, five different cloud or application providers, does your incident response and your procedures tell you who to call? Are all of your third-party vendors and suppliers identified? What we've seen as the hybrid cloud environment has continued to um, increase and grow, we've seen that folks haven't necessarily incorporated all of the information that they need for their third parties at the tool level where you see endpoint protection, at the access management, their third party uh, multi-factor authentications and identity access control and even at network controls or the physical security aspect. And I love that Michael brought that up because physical security is both what I can see and touch as well as what is going through IT access control systems. And I think that uh, that's all correct. Obviously what we've been talking about is 
<clears throat> how do you coordinate? How do you effectively communicate uh, who's doing what? How do you, how do, how do, if I'm the, one of the, one of the themes that, we, that Michael touched upon is, is you never really, you can delegate the ability to do things and delegate uh, uh, tasks to people, but you don't really delegate responsibility. You always retain that responsibility for the data, and that carries on down the chain, uh, down through subcontractors. Uh, and it's very important that you, uh, as Maria uh, mentioned, that you have in your security incident response plan, uh, it contemplates the idea that there's this chain of subcontractors. In addition to all this, and part and parcel of all that is, is kind of this current slide that we have up there, as we transition across this, this landscape of different hybrid computing, and as we have our applications out shifted and everywhere, it's very important to understand exactly when you're writing those policies and procedures and when you're writing that security incident response plan and when you're negotiating the business associate agreement that you understand and everybody understands, the technical people, the, the legal people, the governance people, and then the, the, the executives that are making the economic decision to purchase things, understand which parties are involved. And as you can see from this real quick uh, matrix that we have up on the slide, that shifts uh, depending on whether you're dealing with co-location, infrastructure as a service, a platform as a service, or as a software as a service. It can, you, and, and it's very important to understand, and this is, we see this, these errors happen all the time, that uh, our customer says, or the, the, especially executive, its customer says, well, I thought y'all were taking care of that. I thought that was something you were going to take care of. Uh, and, and that's, so in writing all those plans and policies and procedures in those agreements, you need to keep that in, in, to, in mind. I think we're a little bit behind on our plan here, so we're going to... Yeah, we're a little short in time, so what I want to do is maybe just, um, Michael, if you want to just highlight for us um, kind of some of the major things that have gone wrong with, say, for example, the, the latest Uber breach, right, that was actually caused, um, could have easily been prevented, but um, in public information was put out there that was definitely private. Um, I don't know if you want to just briefly review uh, some of these examples, and then I'd like to wrap up with some best practices from you guys. Yeah, well, well, what we've seen over the last couple of years, not just with Uber, but just, again, as we see on here, the Target breach, Equifax, and Uber, all of these things, all these breaches happened where it, it had some sort of tie to a third party. Uh, Target did not require the HVAC vendor. They had to be compliant when they did require them to connect to their network for AP purposes for accounts payable, um, which is how they got into the system. But... I don't think at that point they didn't have the – well, they did have, but the policies that should have been in place and followed were not followed, or that would have been definitely avoidable. Uber right now, uh, the, the latest one that we've seen definitely uh, with GitHub um, in the background, it's the same thing. Good policies and monitoring could have resolved that issue and not had it in place when you had developers storing code you know, and AWS servers and things like that. I mean, that's – if you have those things in place, if you're looking at that as you set the uh, – your account up or the relationship with that third-party provider, you're taking care of these different assurances, I think that you can avoid uh, – or, or uh, I'm very hesitant to say I would, but I definitely think you can strengthen your uh, position and uh, um, with your concerns as far as uh, – breaches. So as far as what that looks like um, with risk management, what what advice can you offer? What best practices can you guys um, give us here? I'd love to give um, top three best practices. This is Maria. Um, when I look at this, all of the comments have been great and they've addressed everything from management through technical. But if I were you and I were, were giving you the, the free consulting today, I would tell you there are top three things from my perspective. Number one, understand your boundaries. That means the systems that you own, the systems that you rent or buy, um, and the suppliers that are in that system. Understand where your handoffs are because the connection points are oftentimes the weakest point. Then number two, I would implement technical controls for enforcement and management wherever you can afford it 
or it gains you the most efficiencies, like a force multiplier, so that if I have the ability to be able to see and enforce access control and it reduces my body count, then I want to use a technology if I can afford it. If I can't, then I might use policies where I put that burden on the individual users. But uh, some combination of that type of automated technical controls. And number three, document your known risks as well as those, those risks that you aren't sure of but you think they exist. They might be financial, they might be reputational, but document your risks and use that as kind of your due diligence plan if anyone asks. Yes, we understand this is a risk. Here's what we can afford, here's what we can't afford. But that documentation is critical because it actually proves that you're doing your job from a management and governance level and it defends your technology people who may or may not be able to put that into the budget right now. That's great. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, my top three would be, I'd like to revisit the, obviously the coordination aspect with the third party provider. It's uh, really at the beginning of the, uh, of the relationship involving the lawyer, involving the technical people, the governance people, the people that understand what the regulation says, what the requirements are, involving the technical people that know how to do those things, how to actually affect uh, FIPS 140-2 compliant encryption, for instance, and actually having the economic people involved, the people that are going to have to go out and you know buy that expensive firewall that can pull off an IPsec FIPS uh, VPN, uh, having all those people involved in deciding what is necessary, what are we going to do, and how are we going to operate across the life cycle of the information system, so that um, two years from now, when we when we upgrade the firewall or we upgrade or we add a VPN, we follow the same guidelines that we agreed to when we when we form this relationship. We know that the vendor and the technical people and everybody else is all on the same page about who's going to do what, who's going to make sure that VPN is encrypted properly. So that's the first thing: is to get everybody on the same page at the beginning, uh, legal, technical, and, and economic. Uh, the second thing is to, uh, I, I tell our customers, I think the place you ought to concentrate immediately on, the two things, are, are protect the media and protect access uh, control to the media. So obviously the big areas that we see in these breaches occurring are people lose control over storage, they lose a hard drive, they lose access to a cloud, uh, S3 uh, uh, cloud instance, or something like that. Uh, uh, so physically encrypt that media and then make sure that the access control to the media is effective. And then the third thing, and I think the most important thing, is to have an effective security awareness training program. And I think that's one, one area where our, my home state, Texas, is, 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 is really forward thinking. They created in the Texas Medical Privacy Act a requirement that companies like us, business associates and, and covered entities that deal with healthcare data have a security awareness training program it's not just general, generally uh, addressed towards HIPAA, but is designed for our role, uh, our line of business and the role of each employee in our business. So we have HIPAA training at OnRamp that is specifically designed for da being a data center company and providing hybrid computing to customers. It talks about media sanitization, how to set up VPNs and, and things like that. And then, for, and then each of the classes is designed for the individual employee's role in the company. Make sure that the technical people understand the technical things they're supposed to do to make sure that uh, people that are not technical, that are maybe just an administrative, understand what they're supposed to do if they happen to end up with a hard drive in their hands or something like that. So uh, co good coordination at the beginning, uh, uh, legally making sure everybody's on the same page, uh, protect the media both with uh, media, proper media sanitization and access control, and then an effective security awareness training program for all the employees are my top three things. Well, I'd say my three things that um, we do here at APMG working with companies um, seeking third-party assistance, we try to build a three-phase process for them to go. And one is in the engagement of the third-party process. So they need to make sure that they have the proper NDAs in place. Um, you want to set expectations early um, of what you expect from them and what they're going to expect from you. And uh, Obtaining the PCI compliance info from them, the, the, return, the report on compliance, the uh, attestation of compliance, you want to set up your review dates and your mapping requirements, all those things in, in the beginning of the engagement. The second thing I'd say is in your agreements uh, and procedures, getting policies out there 
of how you're going to work together and um, also any considerations that may be there depending upon who you're dealing with, whether it's an acquirer, um, what the payment card brands are going to expect from you um, working with that third-party provider, or if it's anything that's going to be industry-specific, uh, handling of your equipment, uh, how are they going to destroy the data uh, if, there, if there's anything that they have where it's, going to, where it's uh, media-based. And the third thing um, i say is just maintaining that relationship because once you've engaged the provider, once you have the policies and everything in place, then it's going to be that ongoing relationship, and you need to have a monitoring program in place, make sure that that scope is there, um, and just maintaining that inventory of any critical elements of what you're working with, where the data is located, and so on and so forth. Those are things that I think you need to do, uh, the top three for me. So engaging the engagement, you know, your agreements and policies, and then how are you going to maintain that relationship over the long haul? Those are all great insights. I think that um, you know our audience will have some something to take away and and to implement starting today. Um, I would like to uh, take a moment to answer any questions that anyone may have. Um, doesn't look like we have any questions right this moment, but let's just give them a minute to to answer them. Um, and in the meantime, I know that um, we've discussed the idea of establishing accountability from from the top down. Um, do you guys have any insights into you know how you can get more buy-in from your leadership teams and your boards, and how to kind of get that trickle-down effect to make sure you build a culture of compliance within your organization? So this is Maria. MESEC has four ISO certifications. The culture of compliance and security often takes time, and I try to encourage people not to get discouraged, to look at it as a maturing process. You have to crawl and then walk and then run. And so involving top leadership and technology people and getting them to talk together as Michael had suggested and as we move forward is important, but you have to allow it to evolve and mature because it just is a different process in thinking about it all the time. And we actually see it takes anywhere from one to three years depending on the size of the organization and the number of people actively involved. Well, Maria, I appreciate you saying that because that is definitely something that we deal with when, we're, when you're working with most uh, clients and they want to, they, you know, they're looking at being PCI compliant and they're looking at where they can go. Where, you know, that's a huge problem when they are looking at third-party providers because they're just looking for a place to dump everything into and say, okay, we don't have to worry about it. We can wash our hands of it and trying to explain to them that this is a staged process and you need to do research and you need to put these things in place, take these steps. That's really hard to get them to do if you don't have the buy-in from the people up top. So well, it goes, it goes to, to the accountability issue as well, right? Yeah, it does. Like who, who's, who's the one that's going to uh, pay the piper if something happens? That's, that's where it goes to. Any questions right. still? I think so. No new questions have come in. Is there anything else you would like to add? I'd like to add a little bit about what Michael was saying earlier about getting a report of compliance and, and really doing your due diligence. One of the things that we often tell, and you know, I toot my own horn a little bit here, is to find companies that are certified, find companies that have, that have gone. To, if you, if, if you want to know that a company is serious about compliance or your third-party provider is, I mean, see, see what they've done to reach compliance. So, for instance, OnRamp, we're a SOC 2, SOC 3 certified company for a long time. We were a SOC 1 company when that was all that was, SAS 71, that's all that was there. Uh, we're, we've been PCI certified for uh, requirement 12 and some other parts of some other requirements. So we've, uh, uh, our, we just attained a high trust certification. As most people know, in the healthcare industry, there's no such thing as a HIPAA certification but there's uh, a, a private uh, uh, standard that we can meet. It's called high trust, and we've, we've recently met that. 
and, and by doing those, we, 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 we're showing that on-ramp is serious about living the culture of compliance. Uh, and, and it, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, voluntarily going through round the clock, round the calendar audits all the time. We're being audited by third parties. So that's a, I think that's Dad, a big I part so of agree. You deserve the you do deserve the pat on the back. I agree with you, but it also shows your maturity because you start with one and then you go to the next one, and then you have multiple certifications. I think that's fabulous. That's exactly how I look at the world as well. I think that's great. Great, thank you. I agree. Well, thank you all so much for for your time and for joining and your insights, and we really appreciate it. Again. I will be following up with everyone with these uh, slides and the presentation recording so that you can have it for reference. And thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.